Hi, everyone, and welcome to the tips and tricks for a CF parent, or really all of our support system, I guess, because we're all in this together, and support system is key when it comes to living the CF life. So welcome. I know we have an array of audience. We have um, parents with newly diagnosed children, all the way up to grandparents, which we all like to call them our grampians, and they really are. So my name is Summer Love, and I have CF. I was diagnosed at 11 months old, 17 days actually before I turned one years old. And it was on a crazy whim. My story starts out, I was a huge, fat, chunky baby, and there was like this newspaper article in 1980 put out by the CF Foundation that said, kiss your baby disease, and if they taste salty, get them in for a sweat test. Well, we had just moved to Salt Lake City, Utah from New Jersey, and my mom called the pediatrician and was like, my girl, my daughter tastes salty. Can I get her in for the sweat test? And he, we had already been down there. So he's like, no, I promise you. So he knew I was like fat and chunky. And he's like, I promise you, there's no way your daughter has CF. And so she just like, well, you know, I just would feel really good about it. And he's probably thinking, okay, crazy lady from Jersey, your daughter doesn't have CF. But he finally agreed to do it and he did it. And I have CF. So he called her crying and was like, you know, your daughter does have CF. So. Um, I have two brothers, one older, one younger, and my parents um, didn't really want it. They always wanted three kids, but they didn't want a chance maybe having another child with CF, so we adopted my little brother, um, which I'm grateful that I had CF because he is such a great part of our family that I wouldn't, um, you know, want to be here if I didn't have CF. So I think everything works out for reason, and I started Love to Breathe in 2001 um, and kind of just for parents of newly diagnosed children, you know, the internet is scary and I wanted there to be a place for people to go and see uh, adult thriving and living despite everything that CF has to offer because there are some, there are some hardships. But uh, another little thing about me is I'm a pug mom and I had two babies, they passed last year. I never thought I would do it again, but quarantine day 60 had me thinking that I was getting pretty lonely. But now I have Tulip Love in my life, and um, I'm not looking back. She's been great. And one more thing is I'm on day 226 of, and it saved my life in January when I got super sick. And if you know me, you might know there's something missing from my face. And when I am resting, I have ditched the leash for rest. So if I'm just sitting here, I can be without it in Utah at the high elevation that I live, and it's been so amazing. So there's so much hope right now. So I want to, just a couple other things, go over, there's the chat box. I'm sure if you guys are familiar with the cons, you've been um, been in here before, you can see there's that little chat bubble where you can get the chat going. Um, I can see it going now, so that's great. So we really, we really want you to participate, and um, Stephanie actually would really love to know too, names of your loved one with CF and their age. So if you guys don't mind throwing that in there, that would be awesome. And we will also be taking the end of this. So there is a Q&A bubble. And if you just put your question in there, um, other people can look at it and they can vote it and move it to the top and we'll be taking questions from that list. So I think that's all the housekeeping that we have to go through. So now I would love to introduce you to the panel members. John, I will have you go first. Great, thank you very much, Summer. Uh, very, very happy to be here. My name's John Samina. I grew up in Fairfield, Connecticut. Um, I was in the Marine Corps for about 10 and a half years after college and then went to graduate school after that. And uh, now we live in a suburb of Houston uh, with my wife, Claire. We have three children. Luca is six years old. He has cystic fibrosis. Dominic is four years old. He is not even a carrier. And then Annabelle is one year old and she is a carrier. And uh, we're very, very happy to be here. I'm looking forward to uh, a great event today. I already got distracted by the chat. Mary, oh, okay. Um, so <laughs> now I'm gonna, have, thank you, John. I'm gonna have you, Stephanie, introduce yourself. Um, hi, I'm Stephanie. Um, I live in Middle Tennessee. Um, we have three kids. Our oldest kid is eight. It's Carson, and he has CF. And then our second also has CF, and she just turned seven. 
um, on Tuesday, so that's fun. And then we have a, um, a younger without CF, and she's four. So it is a lot of carnival-like chaos at our house. They were both diagnosed with the newborn screening, um, and we have no family history of CF, so that's kind of special. Um, but yeah, that's it. I'm glad to be here. Thanks for having me. Well, thank you, Stephanie. And Laura, And last but not least, I'll have you introduce yourself. Hello, this is fun because Summer and I both live in Salt Lake, so, but, it, but it's been fun to meet other new faces too. I'm happy to be here. I grew up in Alabama and then moved out to Salt Lake probably about 20, a little over 20 years ago and met my husband out here and we have four kids now. Our second is Grace and she's 17 and she has cystic fibrosis. And then we have, um, so we have an 18 year old and then Grace, and then we have 13 year old twins that we um, had them with in vitro with PGD. And so that was, that was exciting and a journey for those of you that have done that before. But um, Grace is doing good. She was born with the meconium ileus. That's how we knew she, her test came back positive about two weeks in. So anyways, she's doing pretty good. She started track half to, back right around Christmas too and has we've seen huge huge improvements in her health since then so that's exciting I'm grateful that I could be here today thank you thank you so much we have had so much fun putting this panel together and I we I just can't say enough about these amazing individuals uh so with what Laura was saying about Trigafta and hope and you know, there really is so much hope right now. And my heart goes out to the parents of newly diagnosed children. Like, I know it's so overwhelming and it's so hard. And more than likely, there's this chance that you've never even heard what CF is because that's how my parents were. They, they had no clue what it was. And, you know, nobody on either side of my family has it. It's just me. And so, you know, it is an isolating disease, but there is so much hope right now with all the medical advancements and just all the amazing things that are happening. And so with that being said, I would love for all of us to give some advice and some heartfelt words to the parents of newly diagnosed children because there are some in here. So um, Laura, I'll have you go first. When I was thinking about diagnosis, um, I, I was thinking about the day that we found out that Grace had CF. And we, like you mentioned, Summer, I didn't know anything really about CF besides what I read in my sister's nursing books that were like 20 years old at the time, which was really outdated and bad. So don't do not do that. And um, so I had gone in to visit Grace. She was in the NICU for three months at birth. And so I had gone in to visit her with my mom when the doctor who was Dr. Pfeffer was there for just a short time when she was born. And, and so she came in and told us that Grace, the diagnosis had come back and that Grace did have cystic fibrosis. And um, ah, it still happens every time. I don't know why when I tell this story, it's that day, I'm sure for all of you, it's such a, a powerful memory. I can still remember, I, I, Dr. Ch or Dr. Pfeffer was telling about CF and I, I didn't even stay to hear what she was saying. I walked out and went um, to the bathroom to call my husband. And I was just so upset. I called and I, I just was catastrophizing and just going on and on about, she's never gonna do this. I'm never gonna see her do this and this. And, and my husband just stopped me. He said, stop, just, just wait, wait. He said, you know what? We're not going to talk about what's going to happen in 10 years or 20 years down the road. Um, we're just going to keep it one day at a time. And, and that's all we're going to do. We're just going to enjoy every single day. And you know what? That's, that's kind of been our philosophy since Grace was born. She's 17 now and on a buffalo hunt down near the Grand Canyon and every day has been an adventure with her and I'm so glad that that it, that that's been the the case for us we just we have to remember to just stay here in the present that's so true and I think that's the most one of the most wonderful things about CF is it it does teach us to live life in the moment and just give it all you got and um, John, I'm going to have you um, go ahead and give some advice. 
Sure. The, you know, looking back on it, if we could have kind of known what to expect when Luca was was diagnosed, the one thing we would have changed was, um, you know, and I recommend this to any any kind of new parent dealing with the diagnosis is, you know, through your clinic, reach out and find uh, a, a family that has children with CF that's been through what you're going through. You know, the, the, the first place you go to after that diagnosis is the internet, which can be overwhelming um, and very confusing and, and kind of take you places you don't want to go. And it's just, it, it's like I said, it's it's quite overwhelming. But I'll, I'll never forget the first parents that we spoke to that had a child with CF. And it, it kind of took us to a, a, a different place with regard to, you know, how to cope with, with what we were struggling with. Luca was our firstborn. Your firstborn in general is extraordinarily challenging as new parents. You put CF on top of that, and it's, it's a very, very hard time. And, and being able to talk to somebody that knows exactly what you've gone through, um, it gives you so much solace and comfort. And, and that's something I do very, very early. And, and like I said, your clinic is, is the best place to kind of, uh, the best resource that you have to, to kind of do that. That is so true. Yeah, do not search the internet is a scary, scary place. Um, connection is key, you know, and I think it is so amazing for all of us to connect. And that's what that's why I truly love these cons, because we all get to be together and learn from each other. And, you know, we're all individuals. So the you know, individual medicine is huge when it comes to CF. And, you know, we're all so different. So that's what's great is like we can learn from each other. And that's what this panel is for is tips and tricks. Stephanie, what about you? Um, I do, like Laura, kind of remember those really difficult first days. I remember the day that we had the positive sweat test and holding him and that like the sling, you know, like that wraps around your shoulder. And I was like, you mean he's never going to be able to go snowboarding? Uh, what was that? I don't even know where that came from, but I think I was just thinking like elevations and breathing and so it's like we do borrow a lot of problems down the road. But one of the things, especially I even think like COVID brings it even more um, real, is that none of us are promised tomorrow, whether we have CF or we don't have CF. None of us are. And um, CF uh, is a crap ton of work. There you go, Summer. I said crap ton. And it's it's doable. And life is still livable even with CF. And medicine has come a long way. So Yes, it's hard, but don't let that stop, stop you from living and, and let your kid live too, you know, like nobody's promised tomorrow, so. I love that. Thanks for throwing that in there. A crap ton of work. Like I told her that we need to quote her on that because it's so true. It is a crap ton of work, but it is so worth it. And the advice I would give is, you know, I don't, I, I'm not a parent, so I don't know, but um you know, I think the CF diagnosis is so much harder on everyone around the person with CF. And I always tell my CF parents that it's harder on you than it will ever be on your child because it's all we know. Like, it's all I know. I couldn't imagine my life and nor do I want to know my life without CF because it has provided so many amazing op like openings of doors of like to be here today with all of you. You know, it really is a blessing in an ugly disguise, but it's my life and I wouldn't trade it for anything. But like they have all said, Laura, Stephanie and John is, you know, we live this life in the moment and we live and we grow up. And so the next like big hurdle is schooling. And so I wanted um, John to talk a little bit about when Luca started kindergarten and how and what are the things that you had to deal with with that? Sure. So, you know, kindergarten was a uh, uh, understandably nerve wracking time for us because it was the first time we were really, uh, you know, letting go of Luca for an extended period of time. And so there's a lot of, of conversations that Claire and I had prior to that. And, you know, we were very proactive with reaching out to the school very early on. So there's, there's going to be a meet and greet, you know, for those parents out there that have yet to put their child with CF, you know, in school. You know, there'll be a, a meet and greet in the spring prior. And that was when Claire spoke to the school nurse and said, our son has CF. He's going to be enrolling in the fall. 
Do you have any children at your school currently with CF, which would be very important to know. Um, have you had any children at your school with CF? Also important to know because it told us, you know, where we should start the conversation. And for us, you know, both answers were no. Um, you know, the next question or the next thing that we did was we asked to set up a meeting, um, you know, with the nurse and his teacher and, and the, you know, the vice principal for us to explain, you know, what Luca needs, which is articulated in their 504 plan. That meeting didn't really happen until a couple of weeks before school started, which is nerve wracking for us as parents. But it's it's kind of the way it has to happen because you know kids don't get assigned teachers until kind of later in the summer. And it's actually a better thing because you want to have all that instruction as a parent to the school right before school starts when it's fresh. Luca or Claire brought our son to that meeting. Um, and so she was able to demonstrate to the school nurse how Luca took his enzymes. And, you know, since it wasn't a meal time, we just, you know, broke the caps and put the cap back together. So there's no enzymes and they could see, you know, Claire putting the applesauce on the spoon and taking the enzymes. And there's just, this is exactly how we do it, you know, and, and they, they, the four of them is Claire, the vice principal, the school nurse and Luca's teacher, uh, went through the 504 plan. They built the 504 plan right there. We talked about think about special accommodations. You know, Luca has a water bottle at his desk, so he doesn't have to use the water fountain at school. Uh, we talked about unlimited bathroom breaks, you know, which are important. Um, you know, we we talked about when he does have to take his enzymes, either the nurse would come to the classroom or he would leave early so that he could meet his class at lunch. But you want to maximize the time that your child has to eat with his class so he doesn't lose five minutes of a, a 15 minute snack period or five minutes of a 30 minute lunch. You know, those those minutes are critical, you know, for your child to be able to eat as much as they can. Um, you know, Luca had cold lunch for the majority of his school, which, you know, like everybody was, was cut short because of COVID-19. Um, but with the cold lunch, we were able to see, because we didn't want him to throw anything out, how much he ate at the end of the day. And so we were able to kind of keep track of his progress from meal to meal, which is, you know, something we always want to do. Um, and I think, you know, those are the, you know, the big things that we kind of highlighted, but there was, you know, constant communication. Oh, the last thing I'll mention is that I actually reached out to the school district and I'm sure anybody could do this, but we found out the hot lunch menu items and what the calorie counts were for every single meal, every month, every week, every day. And so you could see like, what were the great days? for your uh, child to try a hot lunch, whether it's like pizza or macaroni and cheese, it's like, okay, you know, thousand calories in a slice of pizza. That's the day we want to, you know, try hot lunch. And so, um, I, you know, I'm sure the states mandate, you know, that kind of information being available. It's just a matter of, you know, making some call, phone calls to get it. But all those things, you know, we all those conversations we had kind of early on and we're, we're proactive reaching out with everybody. Thank you, John. That, those are some great tips. I know, um, you know, calories and making sure that your child is getting all the, you know, nutrition that they need is so important and can't stress that enough. So sending them off to school where you have no idea what they're eating, those are some great tips. Uh, so as the children get older, you know, there's other, there's, they're going into different grades and there's so, you know, you have to a little bit, take a step back a little bit. And Laura, I actually would love for you to tell us about when Gracie went to school and like the things that you were doing um, and having her classmates rally behind her. Um, yeah, in elementary, I was super involved and she loved, she loved that. So I would come in and I'd bring her vest and show the kids how it worked and talk to them about her enzymes and all that she, I would show all of her medicine to them. And then I would give the classroom a huge thing of hand sanitizer and talk to them about why it's so important for everybody to keep their hands clean, not just Grace, but for the whole class and, and to cover their cough and things like that. And um, it was great at the time. It was awesome because Grace said that when she would get ready to go to lunch, a student, another student in her class would say, Grace, did you go to the office to get your medicine? And they would ask, did you wash your hands? And they were always like, it was like a team effort and they were all involved in and her making sure that she was doing what she needed to do. So that was that was great in elementary. I love that story, thank you. And Stephanie, I love how you taught your children to define their normal on their own, on their own accord. Can you talk a little bit about that? 
Um, I was just going to tell everybody, because looking through kind of the ages of the kids on the chat, they are younger. And I think that this is the best time um, to prep them, to get ready for school, um, to help them feel like what they're going through is normal, because it is normal for them. Um, so have your neighbors come over and sit with the kids while they do treatments so that they get used to seeing them like with their best shaking or don't be afraid to let the kids take their enzymes in front of their peers. And so it can, um, especially with a kid that's maybe friends with them or their cousins even about the same age, it helps them learn how to formulate those words about themselves and their own needs and their processes. So just getting them exposed even before school starts. And even when they go to kindergarten, the situation going to first grade and second grade is going to be different. There's going to be new peers. There's new um, different types of things that come in. And they don't always happen. Um, you don't always understand what's going on. You just think, like, what is wrong? And then one day I found out that my, after my daughter passed out in gymnastics, she was scared to ask her teacher to get water because she's a super shy, introverted kid. And so it just took a lot more dialogue to hey, she's got to have a water bottle. And it was something that, like, you have to talk to your teacher. You can't just shell up and just don't do it because you're scared. And so start early, get them used to their friends seeing what they're doing, and it does make that transition into the school setting better. I love that. It's such great advice. So, yeah, normalizing, I mean, CF is not a glamorous disease by any you know, any, like, the things that we do are insane and crazy. and uh, something that my parents, you know, helped instill in me is just normalizing spitting, like, because it's so, like, taboo a little bit, but we want to get that mucus up and out. So after my treatments, my mom would make me cough, in a, cough and spit in a cup no matter what. Even if I didn't have any mucus to move, I just got in the habit of, like, you know, spitting in a little cup. And to this day, I, I always spit out my mucus. And, um... Yeah, I think that just really helped me. It's just like normalizing these unglamorous things about CF and, you know, so that we aren't treated any differently. I think that's really great. Um, you know, I think we have treatments and we have like clinic appointments and hospital stays. There's all these things that are added to growing up with CF. And so there are tips and tricks to manage all of that. And a big, a big, you know, managing tool is technology. And I know a lot of people um, have their qualms about technology, but it, it can be a good thing. And John, I'll have you um, talk about a little bit how Luca and you manage the technology time. Sure, yeah. So, you know, with or without CF, technology has its distinct advantages and disadvantages, um, and they, they change kind of day to day. You know, when Luca was younger, we found that when he was watching his iPad and eating, he was eating more and eating better. And so we kind of let him have his iPad during snacks or breakfast or lunch. You know, usually dinner, it's we have no technology. But you know, as a CF parent, you know, goal number one, certainly when he was at such a young age, was eat as much as you can, right? And so if that iPad helped him eat more, then then he had it. As he, you know, started to get a little bit older, it changes. Sometimes they get more interested in their iPad and less interested in their food. And so, you know, the iPad time kind of changes. And so it fluctuates day to day. And there's no hard and fast, you know, yes for technology or no for technology. But we just, you know, we monitor the CF first and the kind of the technology second. Certainly during, you know, P, we call it PT, but when, you know, Luke is doing his treatments, hypercell and Pomazyme and on the best. He has his iPad, and, you know, that's perfectly fine, and um, and that's easy for us. You know, when when kids are young, it's, uh, you know, you, you go almost meal to meal and day to day, and, and kind of whatever helps you and them, you know, get to bedtime and bath time at the end of the day, uh, for us was, you know, what, what, what we worked with. And so um, it, it, it's a great tool when you need it, and then, you know, it's not something that we rely on every single day. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. And also, you know, with the long clinic days and things, we still we have to keep our children in, or you guys have to keep your children entertained. So, Stephanie, how do you manage to keep them entertained during those long clinic days? Um, well, our clinic team would probably tell you that we don't do a good job at it, but we try. Um, 
I had a social worker tell me, like, you know, coming to clinic is kind of like their treatment time. They've got to get through it. They've got to sit through and endure. And so the restrictions I usually had with, like, hey, don't bring our tablets with us and stuff like that. I was kind of like, but it does make it a whole lot easier if we have our tablets or if they watch a YouTube video um, in between, like, all the specialists coming in and out. When I have two of them doing all of the CF things, it can be up to a four-hour clinic visit in a 10 by 10 room. It makes me feel slightly crazy. Um, so when they were really little, I would bring those tiny little Play-Doh cups or the wedding bubbles, um, lots of stickers and crayons and stuff like that. But everything that we played with in the room, I would trash it at the end of the day. Because I'm not taking all those germs home, but I don't worry about them smashing the Play-Doh into the clinic bed because they're quarantined there basically for those few hours. And so it really did help kind of just keep them somewhat preoccupied and then have something to fidget with. Um, so that is a good tips and trick really for the clinic. When you're inpatient, um, our kids go to Vanderbilt Children's and they have a very robust um, child life area. So we could get our friends and family, church members, or the kids actually, the students in their class, could go online and send them an email or a card while they've been inpatient. And Child Life would print them out, and we were able to, like, tape it all over their wall. Um, so there's some really good technology, and just talk with your care team about what that looks like, because you don't want everybody coming when they're doing their treatments four times a day and patient. But there are um, some uh, other resources, too, like Breathe for B is a website that will send your child a care package. I think there's something else, too, through the Gunnar Esiason Foundation that they'll do the same thing where you can like sign up and when your child is inpatient, they'll send you them a care package. And doing little special gifts every day, whether it's a Barbie or an Xbox game, it really just helps that time pass by when they've got the two weeks in the hospital. So those little things can help and it makes them think it's fun despite the fact that they have no choice. Wait, Summer, I think you're on mute. You. I am. Thanks, Stephanie. Um, so, yeah, I think that's so fun. And, uh, you know, making making the hospital stays fun and exciting. And, you know, something that I've always done is decorate my room. And I know they talked a little bit about that. Nora was saying she did that in the keynote. And we've always, like, we pick a theme every time I go in the hospital. And we decorate from floor to ceiling. And we just make the atmosphere Fun. And I think it's not only good for me, but it's good for, you know, the medical staff as well. And another thing that my parents would, did from the get-go is my mom would come up during the day and then my dad would come do the night shift. He wouldn't stay the night, but he would like come until I went to sleep. And so, and they still do it to this day. I'm 41 years old and, um, you know, I, I'm so appreciative of it. Uh, Laura, I would love for you to talk a little bit about that too and what you do with Greasy. Yeah, so one thing that we started when she was little and we just kept the, the tradition going is with after clinic visits, um, she knows that the rest of the day is, is sort of hers. She gets to decide what we're gonna do after we leave the clinic. And so it gives her this, like, <clears throat> like you mentioned, Stephanie, they don't feel always like they have a lot of choice. And so giving her that, freedom to choose and sometimes we go to the zoo and sometimes we go out to her favorite place to eat and sometimes we just go we rent a movie and just put on our pjs and eat junk food in my bed and watch movies for the rest of the day but but the key is it's her choice and it's just her day with mom whatever she wants to do after she loves that i do too i love it more than she does i think but I keep doing that, so I keep double clacking them, clicking the mute button, and it keeps going back to mute. So sorry about that. Um, I do love that, and I I wanted to see John. Do you have anything that you'd like to add to that? Okay, perfect. I do. I'm glad you asked. Um, so you know, our tradition is McDonald's after clinic, and um, and you know that's it's just something we hope we always do. And you know, Luca loves to tell his doctor when we're at clinic, you know, said, you know, where are we going to go after uh, clinic? And we look, says, we're going to McDonald's. And said, you know, tell Dr. Reese what you're going to have. Well, a cheeseburger and a milk, vanilla milkshake and French fries, you know, 
there's a lot of you know positive encouragement. There's a lot of fun. Usually there's a playground where we go and stuff. That's kind of our treat. Even if it's not a clinic day, that you know what we started doing is what we call Sunday Sundays, right? So after dinner on Sunday night, we have ice cream Sundays. And so uh, you know there's 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 plenty of good things to do. There's a few times we even went to the uh, the Houston Zoo after the clinic. And so you know certainly on the same page uh, you know with Laura there, and that there are great things to do and and kind of traditions, good traditions to have on those clinic days. And we kind of try to preserve those and make them as fun as possible. That is great. And, you know, I think it that is true. It's just like having traditions and making it fun. It's good for mental health, too. And it can, um, you know, kind of curve anxiety as well. Like I know, Laura, you were saying music helps Gracie and music helps me and just belting out those songs before PFTs, all that stuff helps and it's so great. Um, something with CF that is hard for me is we can't always control how our life is going to look or what's going to happen. And I think as I'm getting older, like I'm coming to terms with that and I do have some control issues. So, you know, being able to manage that and kind of relinquishing control, um, you know, just to be okay and like go with the flow is is harder. It's harder than it looks for sure. But um, Laura, you were talking about how it's hard as a parent. It's hard for you to you know empower and instill and grace for Gracie to like take over her own health and medicine and all that stuff. So I would wanted you to talk a little bit about that. Yeah, we have had to do things from childhood, you know, up until where she is now at seventeen to help foster that sense of responsibility and ownership. And from, you know, we've had every chart you can think of and every incentive you can think of from her earning a dog, which I never thought I would have in my house, <laughs> but I love, I ended up loving, um, you know, to, to different things, but that really has worked for her. She, she appreciates that. And then also, learning that things don't always go great. You know, in elementary, she loved me to be involved. In junior high, she didn't want to tell anybody about CF. She didn't, she wanted to pretend like she didn't have CF. And that scared me to death because she, well, let's say 10th grade, she was on the volleyball team at her high school and went on a trip and, and I had emailed the coach this huge detailed information about her everything she needed to do and then grace came back to me a few days later and said mom my coach said if there's something that needs to be said to her then i need to be the one to tell her instead of you and i said great to go talk to her about your cf and grace didn't talk to her and grace and i went down a long list of things she needed to do on this trip this week-long trip to california to this tournament and she wouldn't respond to my text messages while she was there, my little reminders, my everything. She came back from that trip and she was she was sick, y'all. She didn't she told me she's always been honest with me and she said I didn't I didn't do anything. I was too embarrassed. I was too embarrassed to let my roommates see me. And so it opened up this big conversation about her I mean, she's she's gotta be the owner of it. And I can't just want her to do it and she's not always going to be with me and at some point um she's got to take this on but it was a lesson for her because she was so sick she couldn't hang out with friends she couldn't do anything for a couple of weeks she was on lots of meds just trying to get better and get over it and um that was a big life learning experience that those natural consequences that sometimes teach better than anything else and and also it helped really our relationship that's that has been key and in, in the whole process with grace the journey is that relationship that we've had with her yes learning um grace and flexibility and on that note i'll have you uh, speak about that stephanie well, i was just kind of thinking like i hear you go to mcdonald's and then i take my kids out to some other fast food restaurant that all children love right and i just remember being in nursing school and just being like my children are only going to eat oatmeal you know like <laughs> just really crunchy and hippy and just healthy and and then it's like i need a child that needs to eat vienna sausages and spam so it it has to do with like grace and flexibility not just 
in the process because they're sick, but I guess our own expectations as parents about what parenthood was going to look like or what your family goals are going to be. Like those have to change a little bit with CF. And um, I really think that uh, Issa, Issa, I forget, I don't know how to say her name, who did the opening keynote on Thursday night, I just taught me so much. She said it took her decades to grieve the loss of some of the things that, that just CF took from her. And I thought, you know, and here I have to do it in 18 years with my kid and let him go. Like, ah! So it's just trying to be grace and flexibility with our goals, but also it's their life too, and they're going to make their own choices. Um, and like you said, Laura, those natural consequences are going to be the best teacher of their choices. And so if they do skip their treatments and they have to be in the hospital for a long time, you know, maybe that's all it takes. Summer, you have a good story about not wanting to be sick. And so I think that that's reassuring that those natural consequences are helping us parent them too. Yes, the natural consequences of my parents would say, you know, you don't have to do this, but then you're going to be in the hospital for two weeks. And for me to have to take a time out of like my dancing or skiing or, you know, my volleyball, like all the things that I did when I was younger, like there was no way that I would want to spend two weeks in the hospital. So I did my meds and I was, you know, hyper compliant. And um, yes, yeah, Stephanie, I love that Issa said that, like, you know, like the loss of the things that the, or just the expectations of like what we thought our life was going to look like, you know, and then, you know, making things and adjusting to our new normals of how we move forward. And John, the thing that you said when we were talking about this was um, verify and trust. And I loved that. So if you could mm -hmm. uh, elaborate on that. Yeah, sure. So, you know, Luke is six years old and, you know, we are uh, bestowing a certain amount of independence on him, you know, every day. And uh, but he, he's still six. And so there's like, you know, like you said, somewhere we can trust but verify. Right. And so we'll put his enzymes next to his plate with his applesauce and the spoon. And she, you know, he sits down and say, OK, look, you know, give yourself your enzymes and go about doing other things, whether it's prepping lunch for the, you know, the other kids or one of a million other things that you know, we're doing the three kids in the house and we make sure that he took his enzymes, right? Luca knows to go get his inhaler to do his uh, albuterol. Uh, we call him his pops in the morning. Um, and then we actually started using um, Alexa a lot now. So, you know, there's a five minute wait between when he does his inhaler and when he starts his hypertonic saline. And after he finishes his inhaler, he'll say, Alexa set a timer for five minutes. And then when that goes off, he's usually wheeled his, you know, cart over. He's put his vest on. Um, I'll, you know, connect the hoses and set up the nebulizer. The timer goes off. Alexa, stop timers. What he'll say over his shoulder with his iPad in his chair. And then he turns on his nebulizer and starts his hypertonic saline. And so, you know, those little things are, are wonderful for a lot of reasons. One, your child's taking ownership of their own treatment, which is really important, you know, as early as, you know, they can and you're comfortable with, of course. Um, and the other thing is, you know, for your own kind of mental health and sanity as a parent, it lets you do other things, which, you know, inevitably there's there's a lot going on in a household with a young child or young children. Um, and so it's important, but like I said, when they're young, it's 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 equally important to kind of make sure that they're they're doing it right because they're still young and things they can forget, things that they can miss, things they get distracted by. So we, we kind of verify all those all those little tasks that we let them do every day. That's great. Yeah. And I just love that, you know, having them have independence leaves more time for you guys. Right. And I think that is so important, too, is to take time for you and, you know, um, incorporating family and like uh, the, all the day to day with CF is so important. And, you know, just like the stress that this disease can have on other family members is is pretty big too and so laura i'll have you um talk a little bit about that. yeah oh and i just wanted to backtrack for one second and tell y'all that grace has gone through that rebellious phase and come out on the other end thank you knock on wood i mean she's 17 now but she's she's again open about CF and she she invited all her friends to come to Great Strides last year and she talks about it and they went to see the movie Five Feet Apart together and so 
That's been huge. But I think, you know, like I mentioned, relationship, and there was a phrase that stuck in my head years ago that rules without relationship equals rebellion. And I think that that has been so key, just keeping, um, just keeping that relationship strong. Where now, if she is thinking, and she's still a risk taker, and she wants to do things that are a little sketchy and terrifies me sometimes, and I have to just like put on my pe poker face and pretend like I'm not freaking out inside. But um, but she talks to me about it, and and we can really reason with each other rather than her being risky and and sneakier. So anyways, but, but all this, you know, this journey, this journey that it's been, and um, even especially those first few years, it was tough on my, on our marriage, my relationship with my husband, um, you know, the financial stress of it all, and just the time, the time trying to take care of this child, and, and just the worry about the illness itself, and how to balance everything and those first couple of years man we were really struggling um craig and i were and and i just at one point i just remember thinking there is no way that this is going to last if we don't figure something out because things were just going south pretty quick and um so there were certain things that we realized we had to put in place just to keep that relationship strong and to make sure that that foundation of our family was was strong, and so we one big thing for us was weekly date nights. Every Friday night, um, that was just what we did. We we spent a couple of hours together when we had no money and we were super poor. It may be just in a park doing you know having a picnic or whatever, but we just set that time aside. And I mean, even Friday night as my husband's hunting with my daughter. He found reception and sent a message and said, I wish I was on my date night with you tonight. And so it's it's been really good for us, for our relationship, just keeping that communication open and saying what we need instead of just shutting down or, you know, whatever else, shopping on Amazon or something to deal with. I love that. I love that you guys, you made it happen and you scheduled it you know, for yourselves, you scheduled it into your routine because you knew that it was an important um, aspect of. I would also like Stephanie to talk about the sibling relationships, like so that can be um, hard as well for the children that don't have CF. So. So, um, so I have three total and two of them that do have um, CF. They, I think that part of what drives them is that they know they each get to like watch their tablets and they're doing, they know somebody else is doing treatments with them or having to stay in the house for an hour instead of playing outside with their friends. Um, and so that's kind of helpful, I guess, by having the two that we do. Um, but my four-year-old, she participates like she has CF as well, minus the pills. Um, she will wear one of Carson's old vests. And she'll just buckle it up, put it on, sit beside her sister in the chair while she's going like this. And they'll just either watch the same tablet or they'll watch their own tablets while they sit there. And they just sit there in the chair together. And um, it's funny because they are now they're sending her downstairs to get their Palmazine from us in the refrigerator. And so the four year old will come downstairs and be like, I need Palmazine. And she's like the courier. And it's so cute, but then like, it just helps her be involved and not be isolated because she's not a part of it. I'm sure that will change in time, but for now it's working. I love that. And I think that's a great way to, to get everybody involved, like have her like, squeeze the as I'm in the party jet, you know, like just having everyone involved is like so great. And having that time for family, like maybe treatment time is, game time for families, you know. I just think it, it helps the person with CF feel supported. John, do you have anything that you would like to add with that? Um, yeah, like I said, it's, it, it's a time kind of when Luca gets to relax and settle down, you know. For us at our house, it's right before dinner, so it's a good time for kind of us to get ready for dinner. Um, our, our son Dominic is right next, his chair's right next to Luca. They're both watching iPads while Luca does his PT. You know, lately our, our one-year-old will kind of 
you know, walk over to Luca and she gives him this hug as his vest is on. And she like, you know, she's kind of shaking on the vest. And so this is, it's this cute thing to see, um, you know, if Luca sees new things on his iPad, sometimes we'll put them on the TV and we kind of all watch them together. Um, but it's, it, like I said, it's, it's time for them to relax and kind of just decompress and inevitably the whole house does. And so it, it's something we just try to encourage and let them kind of do what they want to do. I love that. So we are at the time where we're going to take some questions. And in the meantime, when we are waiting for questions to come in, I'd also love for you guys to talk a little bit about COVID since we're all facing that right now and just some tips that you might have for that um, for the audience. So our first question comes in from Mary and it says, what does travel look like for you with all the equipment and meds? So and does anyone want to start off with this? John? Go for it. Yeah, I'd love to take that only because we had, you know, we called, there's one trip we took. Um, it was from to Connecticut, coming back from Florida to Connecticut uh, when we saw my in-laws, and we call it the Trail of Tears because they basically, you know, flights were delayed and um, you know baggage got lost. We switched planes, and it was, you know, it's like three in the morning. Little kids in Newark, wrong airport, car in a different place. But you know, one of the one of the huge takeaways for us um, is when you're traveling with your vest is to check it. Okay, don't ever put it in the luggage if you can if you can take it with you uh, and keep it close to you it's not something you want to you know leave up to the airline to get to you it's better to keep it as close as possible certainly any medications right put those you know in your purse on your person in your backpack whatever you're taking with you um you know other than that you know with little kids and, and just in general is getting to the airport a lot earlier to make it stressful we also, uh, a lot of times when we were traveling, if there's a connection, you know, sometimes you get to, you want to get to get on the next plane as soon as possible. Um, but for Luco, you know, we would book the connection with a good like two, three hours in between. So, you know, if we had to go to the bathroom, we can get, you know, McDonald's at the food court, just like not rush, get a good meal in, um, and just know that it's going to be kind of a long day and and not stress about it and so you know those are some of the things that kind of come to mind you know when it comes to traveling lots of hand sanitizer right lots of hand wipes you know, overall i think it's a net positive you know as we come out of kind of covid19 for the cf community because businesses in general and and people i think are overall a lot more aware of spreading germs and that's something that that, that we all want you know, as a, as a sea of community. And so I think that's a good thing. And, uh, you know, those are, those are kind of things that come to mind, you know, for traveling. Right. And all, um, all medical bags do not count as carry ons. So that's like a great plus. I personally use disposable nebs so I can just throw them away when I'm done. And I can tell you that is like the most liberating feeling to throw it away and not have to worry about sterilizing. Uh, I do wear a mask when I travel. On the plane and I think it's always been a dream of mine to like walk on a plane and have everybody in a mask and that will hopefully be the future and so um, I wear oxygen when I travel so if your child or wears oxygen you just have to okay that first with the airline um, what are some other real like tips that I can think of real fast like I think that's like oh the uh, okay Stephanie after I, this is the one big thing. So everybody kind of gets a little nervous traveling with a vest. And can I just tell you that you use these hands for so long, go back to that if your child will allow it, because you, these you can just pack and just go ahead and do CPT. Like that's yeah. one of the biggest things. So the great, they're, tr they're travel friendly. Stephanie. That's going to say when we've traveled on airplanes um i refuse to take the vest because i don't want to void a warranty for an accident that may or may not be in my control so um we always do like the rubber bells we take those with us when we travel but the other thing that i always do is i always look up what hospital in the area is covered under my insurance plan in case we get sick or the g-tube falls out or whatever the case may be. And so I have a list of places which came in handy one day when we got altitude sickness in Utah and we had to go to that hospital. Um, and But I already, I already had it in my phone. I knew exactly where we were going. And 
husband thinks I'm crazy when I say things like that, but I do plan for the worst when I travel for places that I don't know, familiar with the um, places around me. So check that. Perfect. And Laura, what about you? Do you have anything that you would want to add to that? And also, somebody would like to know what kind of dog you have. So if you could throw that out there too. Yes, we have a Yorkie. That's the one that Grace earned when she was nine. And we also just got a German short hair and that was, we should have stopped with the Yorkie. But anyways, for traveling, we, um, I was just mentioning, if we're going, we are outdoors a lot. So if we're outdoors, we, Grace got the Monarch vest a couple of years ago, which has been life changing for us just because it doesn't need to be plugged in and she can just do it sitting by the campfire. And so we've loved, loved, loved that. And then we have the generator, of course, for, you know, that we do nebulized treatments with. Um, so that, I don't know, besides that, we, we honestly, I wouldn't, we don't do a ton of traveling besides going back to Alabama and, um, but we've, I would just ditto everything else that's been said because I just sit here agreeing with all of you. Yeah. Okay, awesome. Um, so I have, there's some other questions that kind of are from like the same about recommending what like at physical activities can you recommend to your child with CF? And then Tom, Kelsey's dad was saying, how do I slow down my daughter? You don't, you just keep pushing them to live life to the absolute fullest. And I say, if they wanna do soccer, do soccer, volleyball, volleyball, dance, all of it. I wanted to do it all and my parents just pushed me and they let me like live this life that, you know, it was just the more the merrier. And it, I honestly am so grateful that that was like their, they didn't wanna put me in this like glass bubble and I'm so grateful for that. Um, I don't know. Who would like to add, like, add to that? Stephanie or John? Laura? Wishful Stephanie, thinking. Just wishful thinking. <laughs> yeah. 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 Wishful thinking. John? Yeah, yeah. I'd say, I'd say, you know, sports are are wonderful. Um, you know, we talked about instilling kind of ownership and independence in your child, but I, I think an, another thing that any and every parent could do is just set a good example, right? And and. Physical fitness is just so extraordinarily important for everyone's own vitality, but certainly for, for people in the CF community. And, you know, you know, Claire's very involved in yoga. I, I like to work out in the mornings and, you know, it works out now that, you know, since the gyms are closed, my, you know, home gym is in our garage. And so, you know, I let all of the kids kind of see, or, you know, particularly for the boys are four and six, right? There's a pull up bar, there's a medicine ball. Like, this is what daddy does in the morning you know, being fit is important. Daddy likes to run in the morning. And so, you know, when we were back in Connecticut, uh, you know, I ran the New York Marathon um, 2016 and 2017, and we did it for the Cystic Fibrosis Foundation. We kind of teach Luca that, you know, running is good. And it, and it's reinforced when we go to the clinic. And, you know, we, you know, Luca talks to, you know, his doctor about playing soccer and starts as you know, soccer is great and run. These are always good. It's like an extra treatment. That's how it's you know explained to them, and so I think that example as parents is is wonderful to set one, two, and getting them involved in, in their own sports, whatever they are, um, is a great thing. And so that's that's something we encourage um, as much as possible. It's going to be nerve wracking in the beginning for a million reasons that have nothing to do with CF, and then a million more that probably have something to do. With CF. Yeah, um, but at the end of the day, it's it's it's. It's just a wonderful thing to be a part of it. It's great. It teaches them so much. And uh, and it's most importantly great for their health. Right. And I think, honestly, John, it's still nerve wracking. Like, even now that I'm, like, being able to, like, push myself a little bit harder, you know, with Trikapta and um, going out on walks now, especially with COVID. And we have had a couple of questions about COVID um, and just, like, how we're living our lives now. Um, you know, this was going to be my year. Like I was like, I got, I got a horrible virus in January. Like, okay, but now I try to have to save my life. And it's like, you know, allowed me to breathe a little bit deeper. I was like, watch out 2020. And then here I am day 109 stuck in my house, safe in my house. But, um, you know, I'm not being able to like do the things that I was dreaming to do. And again, that's our, that's like grieving that loss of like, what I thought my year was going to look like. And 
I'm just grateful that I'm able to like, you know, push myself harder and try to just get in healthier and stronger until I am able to go out. And, um, you know, I think how I've been living with COVID is everything's been so black and white and the precautions that I've been taking, I haven't seen any family members. It's all through the, like, I'm on my porch, they're on my driveway. And, uh, you know, that's why I got a dog at day 60 because it was getting lonely. And, you know, I think we just have to every day, take it day by day and like bring in a little bit more gray into this, like your quarantine. And so Tulip was a gray for area for me and walking outside. I can't wear a mask when I walk outside. I'm on like five liters of oxygen. So it's hard just to maintain my saturations as is. So with a mask, they do plummet a little bit, but um, you know, that's a, that's a gray area for me. So, and I just wanted to have like all of us go around and kind of just say like how you're handling the quarantine and what gray areas you're allowing in and stuff like that. I'm gonna start with you, Laura. Okay, uh oh, I'm wondering if we have any of our clinic people on here. <laughs> I'm gonna get in trouble because it's been really hard with four teenagers in the house who see their friends hanging out with everybody all the time and and like you know summer we were talking the numbers just keep going up in Utah and if I was in charge of everybody and made all the choices I, we would all be living like summer and just waving at the world from our front porch but we've had to really sit down as a family and talk about what just find that good balance what's going to work for everybody and express you know these are my concerns and we read the letter from clinic and what um, Gracie's doctor has said and the recommendations that he's made and then try to balance that um, so you know the kids they've each been able to pick one person that they can hang out with that is also being careful you know I've been able to talk to their parents I know that their family's also been careful and when when that friend comes over I take their temperature at the door with my little forehead thermometer and I make them answer all the questions and they think I'm that crazy mom but I don't care but anyways it was just about having that mutual just collaborating with my kids so I didn't come across as the you know yeah. just the one that was being awful about it you just have to be smart about it Stephanie what about what about you sorry we're we're coming to our end. I feel like we could talk for hours and hours and hours because we're just, it's just been great. But Stephanie, I'll have you uh, comment on that and then we'll go to you, John, and then. Um, I was just gonna say that we've had uh, kind of the same thing. We've had a safe circle. So we live in a cul-de-sac. We can't necessarily keep our um, kids away from our neighbors. Um, so they have been our safe circle. They have been um, quarantined like we have. Actually, we are the only ones still going to work as essential workers. So I feel really confident of that, especially during like March and April. Um, but I would do the same thing, Laura. I would go and be like, are you having cough, shortness of breath, or wheezing? Have you had a fever today? And the six-year-old looks at me like, what is wrong with you? And I'm like, okay, you passed them. <laughs> so I just, you know, their mental health has really struggled. And um, keeping them away from their friends with my kids specifically, it's been harder than trying to just get them to wash their hands and understand those precautions. So they've been our safe circle, basically. And John, what about you? Yep. Uh, you know, it, it, I think for us it was, it was a little bit of a different experience only because my kids are so young. You know, it's six, four, and one. They absolutely know that, you know, coronavirus is out there and staying six feet apart is important, which is incredible when, when your, your four-year-old tells you that when, you know, the Amazon delivery person comes to the door. Um, but as far as them, uh, you know, wanting to get out and socialize, you know, we're fortunate enough that they have each other to play with and we reiterate that all the time when they say they want to do something. That's why we had siblings so you guys can play together. Um, but, you know, we, we've looked at it as a time where we've been able to kind of enjoy the amount of time we've been able to spend with each other as a family. Um, and, and our kids, you know, they they don't really understand, you know, know the difference at, at this age. And again, we're, we're kind of just fortunate that they're at age. In two, three more years, I think it would be a much, much different conversation. But, you know, for me personally, I've been working from home. I get to see the kids more than, you know, the two hours, you know, from six to eight that I would see when I came home from work. And so 
it's been nice for my wife and I, and we think it's the safest we've ever been. I mean, we don't barely have seen anybody. And so we don't worry about, you know, other kids going to school sick, other kids being sick on the bus, you know, uh, uh, people being sick in the grocery store. So that to us, we, we were kind of saying, like, well, this, this part of it's been okay. Great. Well, you guys, I feel like I do feel like we could talk for hours. I think I want to thank you all for joining us. If you if we didn't get to your question, I'm really sorry, but feel free to contact us in the environment uh, through the one on one chat or if you see us um, during happy hour. Just ask us anything. Um, all of our information is also in the directory in the resource room. And I think that's it. Thank you guys so much for everything. It's been fun. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.